We've already talked quite a bit about enzymes in this course, but only in a general way. We know that enzymes are biological catalysts that act to speed up chemical reactions in the cell so that they are happening on a biologically relevant time scale. We also know that enzymes are usually proteins, but recognize that they can also be RNA molecules as well, in which case they're called ribozymes. In this video, we'll look at enzymes in more detail. We'll discuss the energetics associated with the reactions they catalyze. We'll see how they're able to speed up the rates of reactions. And we'll talk about how enzymes are regulated by the cell. Let's start with energetics. Bioenergetics refers to energy usage in living organisms how it's acquired, how it's stored, what it's used for. Typically, what we're talking about in cells is potential energy, which you'll remember is energy that exists by virtue of position or location or spatial arrangement. The chemical bonds and covalent compounds are a form of potential energy. So when we talk about a sugar molecule or a fat molecule having energy, the energy is stored in the bonds themselves, reflecting the arrangement of the shared electrons. We have also learned already that cells can store energy in the form of concentration gradients across membranes. For example, the sodium and potassium gradients generated by the activity of the sodium-potassium pump. So both biomolecules and concentration gradients represent sources of stored energy that cells can tap into to drive cellular processes when needed. Now the same laws of thermodynamics that govern the rest of the universe are also in play in biological systems. The first law states that energy can't be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed from one form to another, and this is happening in cells constantly. The energy of sunlight is transformed to chemical energy in the form of covalent bonds and sugar molecules. The energy stored in ATP is converted to the mechanical motion of a motor protein walking down a microtubule. The second law states that spontaneous processes are characterized by an increase in entropy or disorder. Or the other way of thinking about it is, it's going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. Going the other direction, increasing order or increasing energy, is going to require an energy input to make it happen. That's not going to be spontaneous. Now don't confuse spontaneous with fast. Just because something is energetically favored doesn't mean it's going to happen quickly. More on that in a little bit. In biological systems, when we're discussing energy content or yield or changes in energy over the course of a chemical reaction, we're most often going to see the use of what's called Gibbs energy or Gibbs free energy, symbolized by the letter G. Gibbs free energy refers to the amount of energy available to do work, and it combines the effects of enthalpy, which you'll remember describes heat released or absorbed over the course of a reaction, temperature, which is stable over the course of a reaction, and entropy, which describes the degree of disorder that results from the reaction. This is reflected in the equation that describes Gibbs free energy. Given that temperature is stable over the course of the reaction, when we're thinking about changes in free energy, comparing products of a reaction to the initial reactants, the change in free energy, or delta G, is equal to change in enthalpy minus T times the change in entropy. So let's look at examples of how this could play out over the course of a chemical reaction. What's being represented in these reaction diagrams is the change in energy in reactants and products of a given chemical reaction over the course of that reaction. So here on the left, the reactants have some amount of free energy stored in covalent bonds, for example. After the reaction has occurred, the products contain less energy. If we take the product's free energy and subtract the reactant's free energy, we end up with a negative number. The change in free energy is negative, or there's a negative delta G. We'll talk about these energy humps along the course of the reaction in a little bit, but right now we just want to focus on the amount of energy in the products compared to what we started with. Well, where did that energy go? It didn't just blink out of existence. It was released to the surroundings, and cells will capture that energy and use it to do work. Chemical reactions in which the products have less free energy than the reactants necessarily release energy and are referred to as exergonic. On the other hand, if the products have more energy than the reactants, then the change in free energy is greater than zero, or there's a positive delta G. Again, that energy didn't just magically materialize out of nothing. It must be supplied from somewhere. 
Chemical reactions in which the products have more free energy than the initial reactants require an input of energy and are referred to as endergonic. Exergonic reactions are characterized by a decrease in energy state and are therefore spontaneous. Endergonic reactions are characterized by an increase in energy state and are non-spontaneous. Now why might the products of a reaction have less free energy? Well, often it's due to an increase in disorder or entropy. Just looking at this mathematical relationship, it should be apparent that if we increase entropy significantly going from reactants to products, since we're subtracting that value, it's going to be associated with a negative change in free energy. More order equals more energy. More disorder equals less energy. Applying this to biomolecules, if you compare a pool of 300 individual amino acids in solution with a single polypeptide made up of 300 covalently bonded amino acids, which is the more ordered state? What has more stored energy? The individual amino acids or the single polypeptide? Hopefully you'll recognize that the more disordered, lower energy state is the one with individual amino acids. Bringing order to that system will require a significant input of energy, as we'll see in a few weeks. Okay, so exergonic reactions release energy, and endergonic reactions require energy. Most cellular processes and reactions are endergonic. How does the cell supply the energy input required to make them happen? Using the energy capacity of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. We've looked at ATP before, but here's the structure again. Remember that it's a ribonucleotide, an adenine base linked to a ribose sugar linked to three phosphates, referred to as the alpha, beta, and gamma phosphates. These bonds between the phosphates represent stored energy, potential energy. Breaking these bonds through hydrolysis reactions releases energy. That's an exergonic reaction. Hydrolysis can involve only the terminal phosphate, in which case ATP is hydrolyzed to yield ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate ion or two phosphates can be hydrolyzed, resulting in adenosine monophosphate, or AMP, and a pyrophosphate molecule consisting of two inorganic phosphate ions linked together. The most prevalent reaction is the first, ATP being hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The cell links that exergonic reaction to endergonic cellular reactions and processes via energy coupling. The basic idea is that an energy coupling the energy released from the exergonic reaction provides the energy input required for the endergonic reaction or process. For example, moving a motor protein or a sodium potassium pump or building a protein. Now if hydrolyzing phosphate off ATP is exergonic, what about the reverse reaction, rebuilding ATP from ADP and phosphate? Well that's obviously going to require energy and cells get that energy typically from organic compounds. So for example, a sugar like glucose or a fat molecule. These molecules hold lots of potential energy. By breaking them down in controlled fashion, the energy is captured and used to synthesize ATP. Every cell has millions of ATP molecules and they are constantly being recycled, hydrolyzed to provide energy, but then being put back together using energy acquired from the environment. So how much energy are we talking about here? Here we're looking at a table that lists the free energy changes associated with hydrolyzing phosphate off some common energy-related compounds. The units on free energy are kilojoules per mole of compound, where one joule is equal to 293 calories. You can see the reaction hydrolyzing ATP to AMP and pyrophosphate here, which is associated with a negative delta G, a release of 45.6 kilojoules of energy per mole of ATP. And here's hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate, a little less energy at negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. Now why are these reactions exergonic? Why do ADP and phosphate have less free energy than ATP? Well, there are a number of reasons, but even just thinking about it in terms of entropy, which has more disorder, one ATP molecule or a molecule of ADP and an isolated phosphate? ATP is more ordered, and it represents a higher energy state. You can also think about the spontaneous tendency of these phosphate groups to dissociate, driven by the repulsion of the negative charges that phosphate groups have. 
If you've had organic chemistry, you learned about electron delocalization. That's another form of disorder. And it turns out that in isolated inorganic phosphate ions, electrons can be delocalized to a greater extent than they can in an intact ATP molecule. In any case, these bonds hold potential energy. Breaking the bonds represents a decrease in free energy, an exergonic reaction. By coupling this exergonic reaction to another reaction, the spontaneous process can drive some other non-spontaneous uphill process going on in the cell. We'll take a look at a specific example to see how this works. This example is somewhat of a preview of our next topic, which focuses on cellular respiration, in which we'll see the details of how the potential energy in a glucose molecule is released through the oxidation reactions of cellular respiration and used to synthesize ATP. This is a complex process involving many enzymes, but the very first step involves phosphorylation of glucose. In other words, the addition of a phosphate group to the glucose molecule to produce glucose 6-phosphate. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme hexokinase. Phosphorylation of glucose is an endergonic reaction, which has a free energy change of plus 13.8 kilojoules per mole. What this means is that the product, glucose 6-phosphate, has 13.8 kilojoules per mole of free energy that an isolated glucose and isolated phosphate would not have. That energy input is supplied by hydrolyzing ATP to ADP and phosphate, which, as we just saw, releases 30.5 kilojoules per mole of energy. By linking these two reactions together, the exergonic reaction supplies more than enough energy to make the endergonic reaction go forward. Well, what happens to the leftover energy? It's lost as heat, as waste. And as in every energy transformation that occurs, some energy is always going to be lost as heat. As long as the exergonic reaction releases more energy than what's required by the endergonic reaction, this coupled reaction is net exergonic, and both will occur in the forward direction. This second example shows the energy coupling that rebuilds ATP from ADP and phosphate, which, as we just discussed, is endergonic. That energy must be supplied from somewhere, and one reaction that can be coupled to it to drive it forward is the hydrolysis of phosphate from an energetic compound called phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. This was the first molecule listed in the phosphate hydrolysis free energy table we just looked at. Cleaving a phosphate from PEP is exergonic. The free energy change is negative 61.9 kilojoules per mole of PEP. And this is more than enough to cover the plus 30.5 kilojoules per mole required to rebuild ATP from ADP and phosphate. As we'll see, this is just one of the ways that ATP is produced in cellular respiration. But again, we see that the overall change in free energy for the coupled reactions is still favored, overall exergonic. This reaction is catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, a completely different enzyme. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of the energy changes involved in biochemical reactions, let's take a closer look at the catalysts speeding them along. Every cell contains thousands of enzymes, each catalyzing highly specific reactions involving specific reactants or substrates. But all of those thousands of enzymes can be classified as one of six types based on the type of chemical reaction that is taking place. Oxidoreductases catalyze redox reactions. Transferases move functional groups from one molecule to another, methyl groups or phosphate groups, for example. Hydrolases catalyze hydrolysis reactions that break covalent bonds. Lyases form double bonds by eliminating hydrogen atoms or functional groups. Isomerases rearrange molecules to form isomers, and ligases create new covalent bonds using energy from ATP. Note that the suffix ASE, ACE, is usually used in enzyme names, so when you see ACE, think enzyme. Each enzyme has a particular structure, recognizes specific substrates, and catalyzes highly specific chemical reactions, speeding up reactions that might take minutes or days to happen spontaneously, so that they occur in fractions of a second in the cell. The region of the enzyme where substrate binds and is converted to product is called the active site, 
and it's the amino acid residues in this region that are going to be interacting with the substrate in highly specific ways to accomplish catalysis. Now remember that this is a polypeptide chain with a specific sequence of amino acids specified by a gene in the genome. Based on that amino acid sequence, specific patterns of secondary structure, alpha helices and beta strands and turns, form that are then folded up further through interactions between amino acid R groups that ultimately lead to the fully folded three-dimensional structure of the enzyme. So these amino acids in the active site don't necessarily have to be close to one another in their primary structure, but in the folded state they form the binding pocket where catalysis occurs. Now once upon a time it was thought that the interaction between enzyme and substrate was a bit like matching puzzle pieces, that they matched perfectly, and that's how specificity was accomplished. But it turns out that the interaction is a bit more dynamic than that, and the model describing that interaction is referred to as the induced fit model. The evidence suggests that the enzyme actually undergoes a shape change once its substrate binds that causes the active site to kind of clamp down around the substrate and leads to a closer interaction between the amino acids in the active site and the substrate molecule itself. This is a three-dimensional surface representation of the hexokinase enzyme that we just talked about, the one that adds the phosphate to glucose to start the set of reactions in cellular respiration. The arrow is pointing to the active site of the enzyme where glucose and ATP will bind. The structure on the left shows the shape or conformation of the enzyme in the absence of substrates. And the structure on the right is what the enzyme looks like when the substrates are bound in the active site. And you can see how dramatic that change in shape is. We'll watch an animation that shows the conformational change associated with induced fit in a more dynamic fashion. Once the enzyme active site is able to interact closely with the substrate, we're going to start seeing different types of chemical reactions occur, depending on the class of enzyme and the specific substrate. But what every enzyme is doing in general is the same. No matter what specific catalytic mechanism is being used, the enzyme is lowering the energy barrier that prevents the reaction from happening on its own at an appreciable rate. This energy barrier is referred to as the energy of activation, and it's represented in a reaction diagram like we were looking at earlier as that higher energy level between reactants and products. This energy barrier represents an unstable transition state that reactants have to pass through in order to form products, a state where covalent bonds are being stretched, bond lengths are increasing, and the atoms are being pulled apart from one another, but aren't yet separated and aren't really together the way they should be either. By interacting with the substrates, the enzyme essentially takes this energy barrier and reduces it, making it a more manageable transition from reactants to products than would otherwise take place on its own. How an individual enzyme does this is going to vary. Depending on the type of reaction, depending on the enzyme, depending on the substrate, there's going to be specific biochemistry taking place and interactions or reactions between amino acids in the active site and the substrates being altered. In terms of specific mechanisms by which enzymes lower the energy barrier, they generally involve one or more of the following. First, when there's more than one substrate, orienting the substrate so that they are interacting in optimal fashion for a reaction to occur. So rather than relying on two reactants just bumping into one another in just the right way with just the right amount of energy out in the aqueous cytoplasm, the enzyme active site binds to both in a highly specific fashion so that they are close enough to one another in the active site that interacting functional groups are brought together and the reaction proceeds. For some enzymes, the affinity of the enzyme for the shape or properties of the energetically unstable transition state is higher than its affinity for the substrate itself. So what essentially happens in that case is that when the substrate binds, the induced fit shape change of the enzyme then sort of forces the substrate to adopt the transition state. And from there, the rest of the reaction is downhill in terms of energy. A lot of times, the ability of some amino acid R groups to pick up protons from the substrate or donate protons to the substrate will change the reactivity of substrate functional groups and kickstart the reaction. Knowing what you know about the properties of the 20 amino acids and their R groups, 
Which ones do you think would be most likely to engage in this sort of catalytic mechanism? Finally, there's covalent catalysis, in which the enzyme will form a temporary covalent bond with the substrate molecule, and this bond will be important for activating the substrate to react in a certain way. This typically involves a reaction in which there is more than one reaction that could take place. So to force the substrate down the desired pathway, the enzyme will form a temporary bond with it to influence how it reacts and interacts. Again, which of these specific catalytic mechanisms is used is going to depend on the type of reaction, the specific enzyme, and the specific substrate. Many enzymes use more than one of these, as well as other mechanisms we haven't discussed. Regardless of which specific reactions or interactions are happening in the active site, though, the effect is to reduce the activation energy to allow the reaction to happen more quickly than it otherwise would. Another thing that we should recognize about enzymes is that often a partner is required by the enzyme in order to catalyze the reaction. This partner is referred to as a cofactor if it's inorganic, or coenzyme if it's an organic compound. Zinc, iron, and magnesium are commonly used as cofactors for various enzymes, and their specific role in catalysis, once again, is going to depend on the specific enzyme and substrate, but often it's their positive charge that's being used to stabilize negatively charged substrates or functional groups. And because they can exist in different oxidation states, they also sometimes participate in redox reactions, accepting and donating electrons. Many elements that are required in trace amounts in the diet are necessary because they perform essential roles in enzyme catalysis as cofactors. Coenzymes are organic compounds that serve the same role, participating in enzyme-catalyzed reactions as essential partners. Many of these are derived from dietary vitamins like vitamin C and K, the B vitamins, niacin and folate. Examples of coenzymes are nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, which we talked about in the nucleic acids unit, and coenzyme A, which are both critical players in the reactions of cellular respiration. Asorbic acid is required for collagen biosynthesis, among many other metabolic reactions. The deficiency syndromes associated with malnutrition are directly caused by loss of the metabolic reactions that these cofactors and coenzymes are participating in. Now, if we think about the dynamic life of a cell, it makes sense that metabolic needs change. The external environment may vary. Within the cell, the demand for certain biomolecules will be higher at some times than others. Energy requirements will change, etc. Well, if enzymes are catalyzing these metabolic reactions and processes, then it makes sense that in order to be responsive to changing conditions and demands, the cell has to be able to control the activities of cellular enzymes to best meet its needs, and that is indeed the case. Enzymes are frequently subject to regulation, either activation or inhibition, through various mechanisms, but often involving interaction with cellular molecules that, in binding to the enzyme, will change its shape and or its properties and or its ability to interact with the substrate, and in doing so, alter the rate at which enzyme catalysis is taking place. We'll look at a couple of specific examples of this regulation, starting with competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, a molecule that resembles the natural substrate of the enzyme in structure and properties, but can't be acted upon by the enzyme, occupies the active site and prevents the substrate molecule from entering, hence the name competitive inhibition. The inhibitor competes with substrate for the active site, and by preventing substrate binding, inhibits the reaction from occurring. An example of this is shown down here at the bottom left. This blue blobby is meant to represent the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase which is a lyase that catalyzes the formation of a double bond in its substrate succinate between these two carbons in the middle of the succinate molecule specifically, forming the product fumarate, which we see here. Malate is structurally similar to succinate in that it also has two carboxyl groups at either end, but its carbon skeleton is one carbon shorter than succinate. Malate can bind in the active site of the enzyme through the interaction of its carboxyl groups with the enzyme active site, but because it lacks that second internal carbon, the elimination reaction can't be catalyzed, so no product is formed. But while malate is bound in the active site, 
Succinate is prevented from entering, so no fumarate production takes place. This type of regulation is sensitive to the concentrations of both substrate and inhibitor, since they are competing with one another for the same binding site on the enzyme. If the concentration of the substrate is much higher than that of the inhibitor, for example, then substrate is more likely to bind than inhibitor, and the reaction will occur. On the other hand, if the substrate concentration is low relative to the inhibitor concentration, then the inhibitor is more likely to occupy the active site, and catalysis will not happen. Regulators don't have to interact with the active site directly in order to affect enzyme function, however. Sometimes they bind at a site distant from the active site, but by binding, change the shape or properties of the active site such that catalysis is either more likely or less likely to happen. This type of regulation is referred to as allosteric regulation. This can result in either activation or inhibition depending on the enzyme in the regulator. If it results in loss of catalysis, it's a form of non-competitive inhibition. Now this type of inhibition would not be sensitive to substrate and inhibitor concentrations because they're not competing with one another. The regulator is binding away from the active site and changing the shape and or properties of the enzyme. If, let's say, an inhibitor is bound at an allosteric site, it doesn't matter how much substrate there is. The enzyme's shape has been changed, and it won't catalyze the reaction. Usually, the interaction of an inhibitor and an enzyme is temporary. The inhibitor binds and releases and binds and releases, and the likelihood that it is bound is directly related to the concentration of the inhibitor in the cell. However, sometimes inhibitors bind irreversibly to the enzyme and permanently disrupt its ability to catalyze a reaction. This is sometimes referred to as suicide inhibition. The antibiotic penicillin works like this. It becomes covalently bonded to the active site of a bacterial enzyme that's critical for cell wall synthesis, and so it permanently blocks the ability of the substrate to enter. Since the bacteria can no longer build cell walls, they can no longer reproduce, and so bacterial growth is effectively inhibited. Many toxins, poisons, and clinical drugs exert their effects by activating or inhibiting specific enzymes and their functions. We should also recognize that this kind of regulation is a normal part of cellular metabolism as well. It's how a cell regulates energy usage, biosynthetic pathways, how it eliminates waste and conserves cellular biomolecules and energy reserves, how it balances supply and demand, and so on. Very frequently, we see something called feedback inhibition, or negative feedback loops in cells or organisms in which an end product of a pathway feeds back and stops an earlier step in the pathway from occurring. For example, let's say that we have a particular biosynthetic pathway in which several enzymes function one after another to ultimately produce some cellular product. The pathway begins with a conversion of a specific substrate to a product which is an intermediate, not the final product. We'll call that intermediate A. Then a second enzyme converts intermediate A to intermediate B. Then a third enzyme would be responsible for converting intermediate B to the final product. In feedback inhibition, this final product will be able to bind to and inhibit, either competitively or allosterically, an enzyme in the pathway. Usually it's the first enzyme or a rate-limiting enzymatic step of the pathway. In this way, if the cell already has sufficient quantities of whatever this pathway produces, it shuts off the pathway to avoid making more, freeing up the use of the substrate for other purposes in the cell. I should mention at this point that feed-forward or positive feedback loops also exist. In positive feedback, an end product feeds back and activates an earlier step, leading to an increase in the rate of the pathway or process. These are less typical than negative feedback loops and typically involve cellular or system level processes in which there's an advantage in hurrying it along once it's initiated. An example is in labor and parturition in mammals. At the onset of labor, uterine contractions stimulate the release of the hormone oxytocin from the pituitary. That hormone then stimulates increasing uterine contractions, which stimulates more hormone release and so on. And I'm sure you can see the advantages to mom in having the birth process proceed quickly once it's begun.